everyone. What a joy and delight to invite you into a conversation today around the art of Samuel Bach and sanctified symbol. We have been fortunate to work together with Sam for more than half a century. And it has certainly been a gift to us to not only work with the art itself, but with the artist. And along the way, Larry Langer came into our lives when in 1994-95, Sam was in the midst of creating a collection of 20 very large paintings, some four and a half feet by seven feet, and called Landscapes of Jewish Experience. And at that point, I realized that it needed someone to help us interpret and present the work. I had just read Larry's Art from the Ashes, the literature of the Holocaust, and I got in touch with him and asked him if he would be willing to write about these paintings. And he certainly said that he had written about the literature of the Holocaust, but art was not necessarily his thing, but he was willing to look. And that was the beginning of a friendship and a relationship that has lasted close to 30 years as well. We have just published um, a collection of some 17 of Larry's essays on the art of Samuel Bach, which is available as a printed edition with signed and numbered copies with both Sam and Larry's signatures. But more important to me is the fact that it is available as an ebook. And you can access it through Amazon for something in the range of $25. It's 500 plus pages with 500 plus images that you can just tap on and see the image that Larry's writing about. So welcome to this opportunity to uh, share these works. There are a couple of quotes that I would just share, one now and one later from Brother Thomas. The most enduring gift is the gift of friendship. And out of the introduction to Larry back in the mid 90s, I would say that the three of us have been blessed with this gift of friendship, out of which has grown the opportunity for so many people to be engaged with and challenged by Sam's work. So welcome. And we can begin with the, for the cover image and then start with that and move from there. So there you have it, the sanctified symbol of the pair or pairs for sure in the art of Samuel Bach. And Sam, maybe if you would begin by talking about your uh, first date with a pair and how that has blossomed into a longstanding uh, romance. Yes. Well, um, let me say that there was, it was a kind of a love affair at first sight. Uh, when I arrived uh, at the airport uh, uh, of Paris um, in uh, 56, as a student of Beaux-Arts, um, I uh, stepped out from the autobus and on the, on, the, on the sidewalk was somebody selling pears. And the first thing I did when my uh, feet touched the... Um, as a uh, ground of Paris, I bought a pair. But I never thought that this pair will um, inspire me later. But it so happened that um, in uh, uh, some years later, um, in 66 actually, in 66, so 10 years later, um, I was uh, invited to uh, represent Israel with some artwork in a big exhibition um, in, in Paris uh, where artists were invited from different countries. And now um, I thought, what am I going to paint for the French? Um, and then I thought at uh, the pair, because this is something that in France means face also in some way. Um, it's um, uh, face of a sucker mostly. 
Uh, it was the face of Louis Philippe, the king, uh, drawn by uh, Daumier. And, and I thought, what, what a wonderful thing to take a symbol, which the French know represents somebody or something. They use it a lot in their uh, caricatures of the 19th century and fill it with some other things that they have never seen before. So I painted about eight pairs in different states of being and not being, uh, sometimes as air, sometimes as fire and so on. And, and um, this was to go to Paris, but then Israel became a little less uh, clearly um, sympathetic. Uh, I remember De Gaulle uh, has, 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 has put um, a hold on the delivery of boats to Israel and so on. And that exhibition was annulled. So I remained with these paintings, which I exhibited in Israel, and they turned me into the painter of Paris. It's a wonderful um, accident that you first had your pair in Paris and then have filled your kettle of raisonne with more than one pair. Um, and Larry, do you want to talk just briefly about this or the notion of a sanctified symbol? Yes. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't know who chose that title because I find nothing sanctified in any of the pairs in this collection. Uh, that's not a criticism because there's a contradiction between the word sanctified and the appearance of the pairs in uh, this collection. One of the problems we face is finding a language to describe the kind of image the pairs have become um, under Sam's tutelage. Therefore, there's an irony for me in this title. I think, frankly, there are two essays that still have to be written about Sam's work. One is called Irony in the Work of Samuel Bach, and the other is called Humor in the Work of Samuel Bach. And I'll say a little later on about each of them. Um, and uh, looking at this monumental image Monuments are built to celebrate something. But I look at this and it's just a collection of stone blocks. The vitality has been drained from it. Um, and so just as we look at these pairs and ask ourselves, we're looking at unsanctified pairs, but the language we usually use when we set up uh, monuments like this is a word like sanctified. So one of the challenges, and you used the word before, I'm glad you did, Sam and engages us to challenge the images he presents to us. And that's exactly what happens. So the first thing I did was to ask a question, which is not a surprise, because all we get from Sam's paintings are the sounds of silence. They don't, art doesn't talk to us. And so I asked myself, why sanctify? And I think throughout these paintings, we have to keep asking ourselves, so what is the proper language to use when we try to describe what Sam has done or achieved in this collection? I think that's a perfect way to move on to the second piece, Larry. Thank you so much. Um, one of the documentaries on Sam's uh, work has been Samuel Bach, The Painter of Questions. And certainly, uh, Sam, if you want to just briefly talk about the secret code that you're about to share with us, um, I would love it. Oh, <laughs> well, I must say I have heard many interpretations and very valid interpretations of many paintings of my pairs. And I sometimes wonder, I look at them and I wonder myself, what is it that they are saying? What is it that they contain? And so I um, kind of, with this concept that I think 
therefore I paint. <laughs> I, uh, I, I thought, and I thought, what, what does the pair finally contain? What is the key that will, that will really open up the secret of the pair? And, um, and I opened up the, the, the pair and I found a key inside, which, which I don't know even where to use because uh, it certainly cannot open anything if it goes up uh, there. But I kind of, not knowing where I was going with all that, I thought of one of the first books that I read uh, when I was uh, very young, maybe 10 years of old, was a book called The Heart of an Italian writer, D'Amicis. And then there is a man who has to stop a train that is going to go to a terrible catastrophe. And, uh, and he needs a red rag to say, don't, don't continue, don't go there because you will never, you will never know what may happen. And he wounds himself and he sucks a rag in his blood and he has this red rag that he stops the train with and the train stops, he dies. So it's a terribly sentimental book. It's written certainly for children about uh, 10, but it was read by many grown-ups, my time. And uh, I think it was one of the most published books in the world beside the Bible, the Damichis, uh, The Heart. So right. I somehow put a, my, a little bit of my heart into that. Larry, thoughts? Yes, but first with a brief anecdote. Many years ago, someone asked me, why is Sam Bach so obsessed with pears? Well, the first response should have been, that's a stupid question. But right. I didn't say that because this friend of mine asked me that. So instead, uh, I answered the question with a question. I said, why was Monet so obsessed with water lily? And why was Monet so obsessed with haystacks? And in fact, why was Rembrandt so obsessed with his own face that he painted more than 40 self-portraits? Well, the answer is because they were artists. And Sam is an artist, and that's why he painted pears. Um, now, when I looked at this, two things occurred to me. We can respond to this in two ways. We can take it quite seriously, as Sam implied. A key fits into a keyhole, and the keyhole is right on the top center. And you turn the key, and you open the door, and that leads you to an understanding of the mystery of why this pair is split in half, what happens to the original integrity of that pair. Um, looking requires us to think, thinking requires us to reflect, reflection requires us to interpret, and there are a number of ways to respond to this. Years ago, I led a group of teachers through an exhibition of Sam's paintings. I don't remember where or when it was, and one of the teachers um, these are high school teachers, kept saying to me, doesn't that look like a face? Doesn't, I said, no, that's not a face. But she kept insisting on it. Now, when I looked at this, now I apologize in advance, Sam. Uh, on the other hand, you have to understand that whether you thought of this or not, what you did is invite me to interpret this painting. So this is something I see. If you look at the top, are those two eyes and a nose and a gaping mouth? Mocking us, in fact. Don't be stupid. Just because you have a key which will fit in a lock and you can unlock it, you really think you're going to understand what's behind this painting? Uh, maybe the meaning of this painting is that the attempt to interpret its original meaning um, leads us nowhere. And it's a wasted effort. Now, I don't think Sam intends that, but and I don't know if you agree with me that that circle on the top looks like two eyes. The keyhole at the bottom is the gaping mouth, and on top is a nose. 
And the stem, in fact, uh, is fitting right into the mouth. Um, and I looked at that and I said, what's going on there? It's something wrong with me, uh, not with Sam or the painting. But it's an illustration of the magic of these paintings, which invites us not to, you know, wander off somewhere into, into impossibility or stupidity, but into possibility. And there are so many ways of looking at some of these paintings and it takes a certain amount of courage to admit that our investigations may not lead us into the directions we want to go. That is, I can finally say, this is what this painting means. Because these paintings are not about what does it mean? These paintings are about how do I make you participate in what I've put onto this canvas so that you become part of the action of the painting. And that's what happened when I looked at that thing. I actually so, agree with you, uh, Larry, because uh, you mentioned humor and irony. I do not think that one can deal with very serious matters of life without some irony and some uh, humor. Irony is very important to give us a perspective for things. But uh, speaking about, uh, I, there is a little anecdote that I wanted to tell about, about um, what you were speaking uh, before is uh, many years ago, I participated, I had a show at the Basel Art Fair in Switzerland. And uh, suddenly, and then I looked, uh, and I had many pear paintings exhibited there. <laughs> and then I, I, I looked at my watch and I saw that I was about to miss the train for Paris. So I rushed out uh, looking for a taxi and I passed near a stand where they were selling new art books. And there was a big book called um, Symbols in uh, Modern Art. So I thought, oh, this will give me something. So uh, I bought the book and I rushed to the train and in the train I sat down and finally, when he started to move about a minute after I uh, got there, I opened the book, looked up pairs, 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 found pairs. And in the pairs, to my surprise, there was a reproduction of my a painting of mine. And the explanation was pairs is a symbol very often used by the artist Samuel Bach. Full stop. So all the book <laughs> explained. And, and, and then you perfectly knew what you were painting about because the yeah. book told you that you exactly. used that. Exactly. So maybe I painted so many because I never really understood what they wanted to say. And I'm trying to paint yet another one. Maybe that one will give me the answer. Who knows? Who knows? The other obvious, no, 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 strong possibility you know, of this painting is that the pair here is a victim, uh, is not in control of this kind of metallic contraption, which imprisons it, which binds it up. Uh, and we have to ask what divided this pair? Um, how do we reunite it? Or are we going to have to admit that we live in a divided world? And even though the pair originally may have looked like this, yeah, uh, pairs don't look like that anymore. You but know, there is each... a little uh, pair on the uh, on the uh, bottom, which is yes, but it's it itself is bound by a part of the ribbon. Yeah. Uh, the ribbon is red, and at the very bottom part, it's blood red, and mm -hmm. there's something a little sinister in that. Although I don't want to push that too far. Right. Well, the other thing is, Sam, when you used the key um, years ago, and Amos Oz was in the gallery, he was standing in front of the painting and actually laughing out loud. To Larry's point about the humor and the irony in your work. And he said, this is really one of the most humorous paintings I've ever seen of Sam's. So the notion that the key itself is embedded and certainly will never be used to unlock this particular structure. Um, is also important to realize that we too are in many instances locked into a situation which we cannot unlock. And in, on the cover of the book, the monograph we did years many years ago, Between Worlds, there was the severed pair and inside of it was a single individual. 
so that many of us are in fact uh, trapped within your secret code. And now to look at the next painting, which is not a secret code at all, but rather an exchange of identities in many ways that actually I remember a similar themed painting in our very first exhibit. I know the people who purchased it. And I remember the sense of absolute delight in it. So I ask that we include it in this conversation to have your 54-year-old uh, interpretation of your born uh, borrowed identities. Uh, you know, about uh, this painting, I, I, I must say uh, five minutes before we started connecting here, I read um, uh, an email that I received from an old friend who went to celebrate his diamond wedding in Paris and just wrote to me a few words um, uh, before he left Paris back to uh, Stockholm where he lives. Now we were friends in the Landsberg the, um, DP camp, displaced persons camp. He was about a couple of years younger than I was. And he made a career in Switzerland. I think he also had a Nobel Prize or whatever. Very important work as a researcher, mathematician and so on. But he wrote to me uh, that he forgot to tell me how much he enjoyed my book that he got to read about 20 years after it was published. And mainly the many things that um, uh, we share and the memory of identity how to dream about having a different identity or how to deal with an identity that was imposed on us. And I wrote about it, how after we were freed, I used to go in secret from my mother to the church because I very much believed in Jesus. And so did he. And so did he when he was liberated. And, uh, and so we had this kind of Catholic identity. And then when I painted that, I did not think only of my identity, but of so many people who pretend to have a very different identity. Um, because it's comfortable for them, because it's, uh, it can sometimes save their life. Uh, somebody who, for instance, was very famous uh, was uh, the filmmaker von Sternberg. Von Sternberg made Marlene Dietrich famous. And von Sternberg decided he's born into a poor Jewish family somewhere in Poland with the name of Sternberg. And uh, how can he make a career in Germany as Sternberg? So he added the von Sternberg. And then the von Sternberg uh, turned him suddenly into an aristocrat and he was invited to places where no one would have ever invited him had they known that he was born in a Jewish settle. So um, this is just an example of, um, of, of, of assuming identities and how it can arrange life. And at a, at a certain point, the false identities fall apart like in that painting. Larry? Well, first of all, um, in a number of his paintings, Sam invites our imagination to wonder what's going on outside the frame of the painting. Those ropes lead somewhere. One of them is taut. It's either tied to something, but we don't know what, or there's a puppet master up there that's controlling what's going on down below. Uh, so, uh, those appear in the form of questions to which there are no answers. And you know, one of the things we have to deal with when we confront human experience is acknowledging that there are certain very important questions to which we can't find an, an answer. I mean, if someone wants to borrow an identity certainly hasn't worked in this painting. Um, I'm not sure whether that's an egg cup and that's an, an egg trying to become a pear and the painting says be yourself 
because you're not going to succeed if you want to be someone else. All you're going to do is break the connection so that um, nothing is going to be whole anymore, and nothing in this painting is whole. That pair is half collapsed. This pear egg, whatever it is, shape is also incomplete. And what was holding that has been severed. So uh, maintaining your own identity is crucial. When you try to change it, it becomes impossible. But once you do that, can you go back to your original self? And I would just add, uh, the, even the egg cup itself is broken. So even the vehicle for presentation itself has been severed in a way that certainly needs to be supported by some of those ropes. And it's not clear whether the ropes are supporting it or not. I love the idea of these ropes indicating um, manipulation or control outside of us, outside of our identities, either real or borrowed. And so much goes on in a very small space that invites us into the land of box questions. Can we look at no. the next piece, Caroline? Yeah, can we say, go back just for one second? Sure. Don't overlook the presence of one of Sam's favorite images. There's a bullet hole in the wall. Okay. Violence, okay. where did it come from? Why is it there? Um, don't expect me to give an answer, but it raises certain <laughs> issues about the disruption of a serene presentation of images because there's nothing serene uh, and nothing sacred in those images. Or let's go on to the next one. Yeah, where the, where the dripping continues um, essentially in this piece. But Sam, I'd love for you to just talk briefly about um, this image. Well, I will go back to the um, uh, bullet holes here in the wall. I have a very, uh, I'm very fond of bullet holes. Because uh, one day, one day before we escaped from the convent, and two days before the Russians arrived to liberate us, I was we were sitting in our malina, and suddenly there was uh, the fighting in the streets going on, and we heard some sound, and I was sitting with my mother on a on 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 a bed made of books, and. Suddenly, she took me um, by my uh, shoulder and pushed me down, and the two of us fell to the floor because there was sound of machine guns. And when the sound of machine guns, after some minutes, uh, went um, stopped and uh, we were heard it from more far away, we looked up, and just at the wall over of uh, next to our bed was a row of um, uh, bullet holes. And uh, so I owe these bullet holes <laughs> to have <laughs> accepted the bullets instead of uh, having preserved them for me and for my mother. So um, this is just an anecdote of, um, uh, uh, of this painting. Larry, you said Rembrandt painted a 60 um, self-portrait. I painted almost 10,000 self-portrait. In some way, each painting of mine is a kind of a self-portrait. As I said before, I think, therefore I paint. And what I think is, is, is me. And I don't have to face my, uh, paint my face, but I can paint my brain and what it includes. And what my brain includes is this sense of uh, precipice. We constantly live in a situation where an, something starts to fall apart. And sometimes we notice and sometimes we do not notice. Here, obviously, the floor is falling apart, the table is going to turn over, the things that were on the table are melting, and, um, and behind us is a painting, also hanging crooked, of a volcano, and the fire. And the sense of living on a volcano, I uh, constantly reinforce in myself uh, by reading newspapers. <laughs> tragically. Tragically, <laughs> tragically. 
Larry, please. Well, you know, Yeats has a famous poem in the middle of which he has the lines, things fall apart, the center will not hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. And when I looked at this painting, I said, everything is slightly off center. The painting is askew. The table, as Sam mentioned, is off balance. Um, and uh, remnants of uh, 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 disruptive flooring uh, is there also. Um, and uh, there has been some kind of motion or movement that has caused everything to spill onto the table. And now it's melting. Is there a source of heat? Uh, there's flame up on top and uh, kind of fiery color in the background. So, you know, there, there is no ever clear, final, correct meaning to what I just said. But possibilities of all kinds exist. And one of the things Sam does again and again, as he mentioned, is uh, force us to meditate on a human experience in which things so often go awry and fall apart. And all we can do is make sure our enters our consciousness so that we know the kind of world we're living in. It seems to me, Larry, very much so what you're saying that it is, and one of the shows we did recently of Sam's work was called Unstill Life. And yeah. the traditional Dutch still life with everything in perfect order, the dishes indicated the class of the people who own the objects and so on. And here this becomes an unstill life that is a reflection of the times in which we are living. Namely that they are disarrayed, they are melted, they are fallen. The entire space in which they find themselves is not perfectly ordered, but just the reverse, perfectly disordered. There's a sense of both beauty and unease at the same time beauty in the way that it is painted and unease because it represents a world that is totally um, uncomfortable and broken. And finally, in the many years that we had the frame shop, I'm still disturbed, Sam, that we need to take the frame back and have it repaired around the painting in the background. So let's move on to the next piece, please. Yes. There you go. Sam, right. please, the way we are. Yes. Well, um, this is another variation of a theme that I painted for my painting, which I had of Paris many years ago, I think in 75 in New York. And I thought about our social structures, how it is created, where people on the top have it quite easily. Uh, they, they do not uh, feel any weight on their shoulders. Everything comes to them very simply and very easily. And then there is the middle class that uh, pays the taxes that the rich do not pay and so on, and is uh, certainly sensing a weight. And then there are, of course, the most of the Asians, most of the black, most of the blue collar uh, pairs, <laughs> they sense a very strong weight and they are being squeezed in our Western culture and so on. So this is a sociological painting. Larry, uh, your turn, and then I have some thoughts as well. Well, also, you'll think I'm crazy. What I see on the top is a metal helmet. The Germans in World War I used to wear helmets that looked exactly like that. And so the central metaphor for me in this painting is one of violence, the weight of the stone. Sam is miraculous at painting rock and stone. I don't know how he does it. It appears in so many of his paintings. And my initial thought when I looked at this was that pairs have a certain vitality. They can reproduce themselves, but the fate of what 
that pair reproduces ends up because of the oppressive forces that surround us to be crushed at the bottom. Now, the other thought I had was that when God exiled Adam and Eve from the garden, they left innocence behind, but he did give them one hope. He said, be fruitful and multiply. And that's just what is happening here. But the fate of the pairs that are given birth to in this image for me is out of their control. Because as I said, the stone, which itself is a metaphor of the weight that prevents the individual from being totally free and able to create his or her own future, uh, is in contradiction to the vitality of the pairs on the top. And so there's an ambivalence uh, in that contradiction. Um, this pair is fruitful. The pairs on top are not in a state of decay, but their fate is at the bottom. Maybe all that means is that we are born and we die, uh, because that's what God told Adam and Eve, Eve too. Uh, Milton says in uh, the opening of Paradise Lost, eating you know, the fruit brought death into the world and all our woe. The bottom of this is all our woe, but the top is the life that we begin with and we spend our existence wrestling with the forces that try to prevent us from realizing a fruitful destiny. That so is a perfect opportunity for me to indicate to whoever's listening or watching to feel free to have your own interpretation to send it in in the chat box if you would like. If we're able to share it, we will. And if not, we'll talk about it afterward. Two things come to mind. One of which is that I've just finished reading a book called Half American, which is essentially about Blacks during the Second World War. And Sam, when you were speaking about this as the, the wealthy, the middle class, and the underclass that is being crushed, the entire book is about being crushed in a country that was fighting again to save the world for democracy and so on. And then when these black soldiers returned to this country, they found themselves, if not as bad off as the ones in the lower layer here, even worse. And the other thing I want to share is that in 68, when we did our first exhibit of your work, and a number of works were included of pairs, both the Harvard and MIT newspapers reviewed the show. And their headline essentially was, this is the most important contemporary exhibition that we have ever seen. And by contemporary, they meant that you were talking about the world in which they are living, and sadly, the world in which we are still living. These paintings seem to resonate in such a profound way with what we live with on a daily basis and need to continue to address it as best we can to leave the world a little bit better than it may be. The next painting is one that I certainly uh, love. It has come into the gallery today. It's, the show is being installed. And as of tomorrow and for the next six or seven weeks, the full collection of these works will be available. But Sam, if you talk about um, Inflammable. Well, uh, it was the idea uh, which you already you saw of the volcano and the fire and the painting hanging there and then exploring and looking at it a little close, looking at the fire. Uh, I love to see it in the wintry days, and this is certainly painted in the, one of the wintry days, looking at the flames <laughs> in my fireplace and then thinking of, of where do they go? All those... Uh, shopping bags of uh, Roche brothers or uh, the wood that was cut uh, 10 years ago somewhere that I don't know. And, um, and, and I was thinking of simply of the cycle of life, of this kind of going, uh, returning, and of course, inevitably thinking also of the burning of corpses in uh, the camps of extermination. And um, somehow the cycle of life, 
or existence. Larry? Oh, Sam, I, I, I hug you for saying the burning of coffins because when I mentioned to my wife that pair is a furnace in which the corpses of Jews were burned. When mm. I said, Sam will tell me I'm crazy when I say that. Mm. But fire <laughs> is part of the legacy of the contemporary mind, destruction by fire. Um, uh, God promised Noah never, never destroy the world by flood anymore. In the 60s, James Baldwin wrote a collection of essays called The Fire Next Time. And in fact, during the Holocaust, the fire next time did come. I look at that mountain and not only do, you see, do I see a volcano, first of all, I see a mountain. And you have to understand, everyone won't, the importance of mountains in the history of the Jewish people. God spoke to Abraham on a mountain. God gave Moses the Ten Commandments on a mountain. Noah's Ark landed on Mount Ararat. What's happened to the images of promise and of future that began with mountains in Torah and became an image of destruction? That is not a crematorium chimney, but I can't help looking at that and seeing that as a reflection of Sam's use in other paintings of smoke rising in a column of the sky. And yet for me, there's, I'm, I'm glad, Bernie, you said that's one of your favorite paintings. There's a, a haunting beauty, the pink color and the contrast between the pink of pears floating, we don't know where, heavenward? Is there a heaven they float to or just into the distance as so many of Sam's trees do, just floating away? And in contrast to that, um, I don't know how you create the, the sense of uh, burning hot fire, uh, the bright yellow color in contrast to the much tamer pink color forms for me a haunting beauty. Um, and the other thing which I should have mentioned earlier, in so many of these pear paintings, the structure of the pear blocks our vista of the natural background preventing us from seeing any latent beauty in that natural background. And here, some of it is exposed, and uh, I assume it's a sunset there. So there's a contrast between the inflammability of life and the almost serenity of those floating pairs in the sky. But in other paintings, uh, uh, those, uh, there would be dark clouds reminding us of the fate of the Jewish people. So that, that ambivalence between, this is for me a classic example of what in an earlier essay on Sam, I said his paintings are appealing and appalling. And uh, they're both in uh, this painting. There's an art for me, as I said, a haunting beauty of the color contrast here and the vista, which we finally, finally get a sense of of a vista is seeing something beyond the immediate uh, structure. Um, and here we do see a kind of sense of space that we don't get in the other thing. There is, as you know, Larry, and you've done it, and we've done it many times, talking about either appearance or reappearance. So the notion that the paintings invite the idea of punning, not in only a humorous sense, but also in a serious sense, that helps us reposition how we look at the reality with which we are now living. And the pairs certainly do that. And we've not shown one of them, but many times pairs are giving birth to other pairs. The shape itself is that of a generative force of the womb and out of it comes pairs. So there's a sense of continuation, sometimes very distorted, sometimes very painful. And in this case, as you point out, the combination of both appalling and appealing with it, with the beauty of the color, but also the necessity to encounter the meaning of the images themselves, especially with the fire and flame and crematorium in the foreground. So we can move on to a much, for me, more enigmatic, but movement of Sam's world um, into the combination of his um, tools of the craft and really? the pair. 
Real quickly, Mr. Pucker, we have a couple of uh, nice insights from viewers. Sure. Um, first, Tim, he says, to me, the meaning of the painting secret code is that the key to release us from bondage can be found within ourselves. And then Howard says regarding this painting, seeing a pillar of fire emanating from the volcano, I am prompted to ask whether Sam can comment on the presence or absence of theological elements and motifs. Larry is addressing the sub that subject even as I write, but I wish to hear from to hear Sam comment on the theological content of his work. Well, um, I must say I uh, I do, I am a God fearing atheist. This is where I'm speaking when I'm speaking of the divine. I am a God-fearing atheist because I fear what in the name of God can be done to humans. Uh, God is a, a kind of a very um, a blurry idea in my head. Um, uh, even the Jewish God, when uh, the famous, when the famous Jewish um, uh, philosopher Maimonides started to speak about the impossibility to describe <laughs> God and, and give him an image and so on. And then later, a, a Spanish Jew, uh, Spinoza, inspired by Maimonides, tried to touch this subject. He was kicked out from uh, the Jewish um, uh, community. So uh, what is happening today in Israel, it gives you an idea how helpful a certain concept of God can be to the Jews there. And uh, at the same time, although I do not believe in uh, the power from above, I believe that there is something very special and in the encounter between individuals. There is a certain spirit that when people connect with each other, maybe you can call it care or friendship or something like that, which is so precious, which is so difficult to define by words that I leave it at that, uh, that I, it's, it somehow brings me back, maybe not entirely, but somehow to the basic idea of Buber, that the, between the uh, thou and me, there is something that happens between human uh, people that he, I think, uh, uh, dared to call divine. Um, so um, a fear of... Uh, of the of, of the puppeteer because uh, today we know I mean we know there are puppeteers uh, we we look at the news uh, of CNN and it's full of puppeteers they they pull all kinds of strings and so on um, but it's a very difficult question to answer. Larry, any thoughts? Well, I, I, I thought I already spoke about this. Um, then you don't need to. I was, Sam, we'll come back to the unanticipated partnership, but I, the relationship between you and Larry is one of those gifts that somehow stands out as uh, more than human rather than making it divine. But from my perspective, it, it has been such an absolute joy um, to be, um, in this case, both a bystander and upstander and in tribute to Margot, um, but to also just watch the generative friendship that the two of you have had in terms of your painting, the paintings, Larry responding to it, that response uh, incentivizing you to move along with your own conversation, your own search. And certainly as we come to this painting, I would um, welcome both of your thoughts um, of the revolt. Yeah. Sam, do you want to begin? Well, uh, 
I, 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 I must say uh, here the revolt is the sense of somehow a revolt against the concept of realizing that I am almost 90. Right. And saying, uh, can I still do the things that I was doing uh, when I was 20 or 30? Well, let me confess there are some things that I cannot. But in painting, I still tried. And this is one of the reasons why uh, kind of in such a futile way, I return to measure myself against myself <laughs> at another age. This is what painters can do. I think it's very difficult for people in other professions. But here I could try to go back to something that I really had a feeling I have finished with it and, and look at, at my brushes and look at my, the tubes of my color and on my canvases and tell myself, oh my God, and here I bring God into the picture. Uh, uh, there is so much stuff. There are so many pairs in them. Those tubes contain entire worlds. So let me see what I can get from them. And there was a lot of struggle. And there were uh, some things that I realized I cannot do anymore, like, you know, very large paintings or so, or uh, uh, painting for 10 hours uninterruptedly. Now I must make pauses and so on. But nevertheless, nevertheless, I somehow revolted against myself. I revolted against the idea of the age I have. Uh, um, even revolted maybe against uh, uh, what I feel when people say, Oh, but you look so young, uh, which means that I look, I, I, I should look differently. Um, so um, I, if you think that I understand this painting fully, I give up. I do not. <laughs> then we'll turn over to Larry. This is one of the most violent paintings I've ever seen, Sam produce. But it's because there's a contest. Um, and an interaction between art and what one of the paintings before called the way we are, reality, the human experience. There's a contest between the two. Uh, despite the implicit violence in which the artist pierces the reality, trying somehow to expose the, its, its insides, whereas these sometimes surrealistically distorted pairs are fighting back and affirming to the artist, look, try as you might, you're never going to capture what we represent, that is human experience. So there's a contest between the two. And in fact, who's going to win? We have no way of knowing. In a sense, it's a tribute to the artist for not giving up in this contest, being determined to not escape or circumvent, but confront directly the contradictions that human experience offers, not only to the artist, but to all of us. Um, I love that, Larry. I was, as you were speaking, was thinking of the close to 10,000 works of art of Sam's advancing with this collection and becoming part of his diary that we're all somehow able to share and engage with um, and know that this is his singular journey but at the same time it invites all of us into those same questions the same struggles the same desire to articulate visually where he is at personally physically and emotionally and that gift of what art can be, that's, I think, one of the conversations that you and ha Sam have had over all these years, where you're seeing this painting in a particular way. Sam painted it, is now seeing it, and hearing what you say will incentivize and enable other paintings to be born. So the whole generative part of your friendship and relationship is a gift to all of us. 
We're going to end with, I think, a perfect description of Sam um, in its title as a storyteller. And certainly, Sam, look forward to your telling us a story about the last painting. So, Larry, go on. <laughs> For me to go on. All right, you know, I mean, I just love this painting. You know, let me tell you what it, what went through my mind as I entered its reality. Just as you can't read Romeo and Juliet and Hamlet and say, now I understand Shakespeare as a dramatist. You can't look at five paintings by Sam on a single theme and say, now I appreciate the achievement of Sam. This painting is crowded with themes and topics that have invested so many of his earlier paintings. And I chose this because what is saying to, to me, what it's saying to us is that don't just look at a few of the paintings. There's a narrative arc in the creative work that I've done that not only traverses decades, but traverses images and metaphors and symbols. And he's managed to gather there half dozen of them. One house, the Vilna ghetto. One book, Torah. Uh, the promises God made to the Jewish people. Um, I meant to mention in the previous painting, but you see a little of it here too. Sam has a, um, a fondness for setting some of his images on a stone platform. And for the first time, when I looked through them uh, in this exhibition, I said, they're not platforms, they're altars. Uh, in a lot of earlier paintings, uh, Sam evokes the Akega. Uh, a place of sacrifice and the binding of Isaac. When I see little pieces of rope and a platform like that and a painting by Sam, it always reminds me of that initial sacrifice. But we also see a broken rainbow, the promise to Noah, the wandering Jew, the traveling of the Jewish people, going in the wrong direction, the right direction, in any direction? Is it just wandering? Um, the fragment of a uniform of a Holocaust survivor right up in the left-hand corner. Um, and the other, to me, when we talk about new perceptions of old appearances, it may seem as if this table should immediately collapse because it's only got one leg supporting it. None of the other legs, we can't see the fourth one, are supporting it. So the artist is able to defy not only the laws of physics, but the laws that cause images to disappear. We have a tableau of entire life work in this single painting, uh, a storytelling. And uh, it's really stories telling. There's a pair here, of course, because it's about pairs. But there are so many other, um, is this part of a crucifix? We don't know. Uh, you can get fanciful, but you might read a Hebrew vav out of that image. And uh, um, a Hebrew gimel, I mean, and a Hebrew vav out of the pole there uh, for Vilna ghetto. This is another favorite icon of Sam's. So this is an accumulation of a life work in this single painting, it seems to me, and an invitation to the viewer to go beyond just this collection and try to apprehend the world of ambivalence, of continuity and discontinuity of support and collapse that inhabit so many of his paintings. And so uh, I just fell in love with this painting. Thank you, Larry. Sam. Thank you so Beautiful. much. I, uh, there is not much I can add. I, uh, I think at this point I should really do something that I, I don't think that I ever did before. 
is Larry, because I never found the words, is Larry is to thank you so much for all these 30 years in which you were feeding me with ideas for paintings to come. Uh, you uh, because I paint, I paint in order to understand more or less what I am doing, and I never get it uh, really with the first attempt. And then you came into my life, and you gave a certain, very important uh, interpretation, uh, a sense of what it was about which was in some way beyond what I, I dared to hope for or expect. And it certainly reinforced in me very much my belief in the communicability of what I was doing. So uh, what I owe you, Larry, is enormous. And, uh, and you know, my vocabulary shrinks uh, with time. So if it was difficult for me in the past to find the right words, it is almost impossible now. So before the tears start to run from my eyes, I, I just say, Todaraba, Adank, uh, Grazie, Merci beaucoup. Thank you, and thank you again. All right, so Bernie, let me add this. You talked okay. about the marvel of friendship, but it's more than friendship. The word you're looking for is love. I love these paintings, and I love the artist who painted these paintings, and I love you for being an intermediary between us, and for so many other reasons, which I won't go into here. Um, and uh, that's sustainable. Amidst all the chaos that we're, you know, uh, facing right now, the possibility of human love is what makes existence bearable. Uh, Sam and I are luckier than the rest of you because I believe this is so. We both have great grandchildren, isn't that true? Yep. Yes. Uh, yeah. And. Um, uh, the notion that at 94, I would three, have three such adorable great-grandchildren, I'm sorry to say this, Sam, living no more than 20 minutes from where I live, so that I can see them all the time and hug them and watch them grow up uh, is more sustainable than anything else that exists in my life right now. Uh, I promise my great-grandson, I would attend his bar mitzvah. I only have to hold out for nine more years now. Mm -hmm. Do I want to do that? I don't, we'll see. Okay, but see, Sam, I mean, you wipe my tears, I'll wipe your tears, all right? <laughs> right, it's quite beautiful. So two things that I would add, if I might. One is, the, as I've said earlier on, the joy of the two of you and both watching it and grow and continue um, into uh, this age that you both are, both uh, now almost 90 and over 90, but age has nothing to do with the love and friendship that you two have exhibited for one another, and out of it comes an enormous gift to all of us. So for that, I would thank you both ever so much. Um, and end with a quote, of course, from Thomas saying, art is something seen about something unseen. And what you help us do is see the unseen and then be able to think about that and how it can incentivize us and encourage us to, I think, interact somehow with the world in which we are living. So not only as, as observers, but also as participants and hopefully at certain moments as change makers. And if art can do that in any small way, then it's a gift to all of us. I just want to thank everyone for watching, and this will be recorded and shared, but I see it as a document in a wonderful way about the best in all of us. Sam, obviously, thank you. Larry, thank you, and thank all of you for being with us today. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs>